it's great to always great to come to 168th Street Fort Washington. It changes every year. It's a little bit more high end, um, but the <laughs> people remain the same. I, whenever ta I give a talk, I acknowledge my mentors. I just need to acknowledge someone very special, Judy Rabkin, uh, who 17 years ago, one of my mentors, Tom Coates, called up Judy Rabkin and said, I got this good lad. He needs your help writing a grant. <laughs> She never met me. Little, little did we know, we found out five, seven years later that I'm good friends with her daughter, Miriam. Um, but she didn't know me, I didn't know her. And she spent 50, 100, 150 hours working on this grant, my first R01 that ever got funded. And um, she was very generous, so thank you, Judy. Um, today, I'm talking about, the topic is what has love got to do with it? This wasn't the original title. I sent the title to Pat, and Pat said, that's so boring, David. <laughs> How am I going to get people in the room? So you got to change the title. And so I focused. I said, well, well, I'll lead with one of the papers, which is entitled, What Has Love Got to Do With It? But then it got me thinking more about the concept of love, which became a really nice theme in the talk. And so I'd like to thank Pat for spurring me on. And in fact, I'd like to take a little bit of a risk here, and that this is going to be a sing-along talk. <laughs> and there's a few points where we got to just channel Tina Turner <laughs> and say, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> All right, so when I go one, two, three, I want to hear from the whole crowd. <laughs> We're going to practice. One, two, three. Love. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> That's not bad. I like it. You don't warm up. This would never work in Boston. They're oh, way too stiff in Boston. <laughs> I, hear, I hear New Yorkers have personality. Um, we are now talking with the revolution of HIV treatment, really realizing that HIV treatment prevents transmission uh, from positives to negatives with the advent of pre-exposure prophylaxis, with behavioral counseling, and in getting people into care, tested into care, we are now talking about the end of AIDS. And this is great, great news. But there are many challenges to realize this. I'd like to talk, uh, speak to five different points, which are, I think are challenges to realize this goal of the end of AIDS. And this is adherence to HIV treatment, adherence to treatment among people with early disease in order to prevent uh, transmission, loss to follow up, adherence to PrEP, and I'll end on patterns of adherence. I got into this field with Pete Gordon in 19, in the mid late 80s, early 90s. And that was a time when HIV was a terminal disease. And in 1996, HIV treatment was transformed to make it a very manageable and chronic disease. But with this transformation of HIV treatment, many people were very concerned that on the t heels of the MDR TB epidemic, that if we gave mentally ill, the homeless, drug users, HIV treatment, that they would miss their doses. This would generate drug-resistant virus, which could be transmitted to another person, leading to an epidemic of multi-drug-resistant HIV. And the concern was that maybe we, there's a public health rationale to withhold treatment. As this New York Times says, uh, doctors withhold HIV pill regimen from some failure to follow a rigid schedule could hurt others they fear. And then this same discussion played over again as we too slowly recognized that 90% of people living with HIV are living in the poorest regions of the world, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. And as this one of many quotes uh, states a similar concern that in sub-Saharan Africa, the potential short-term gains from reducing individual morbi morbidity and mortality may be far outweighed by the potential for the long-term spread of drug resistance. In Africa, a higher proportion of patients are likely to fall into the category of poor adherers and less resource-intensive adherence programs are available. So people thought, well, you can't give antiretroviral therapy to the poorest, the least educated people in the world. How could they take, how could they ever adhere to this complex therapy? Well, to make the long story short, the homeless didn't do so bad and didn't generate much drug resistance. And people living in South Saharan Africa did even better. This is a paper uh, that summarized uh, all the adherence data to date at, at, as of this time in 28,000 patients and found that 
in general, in resource-rich settings, about 55% of people were classified as adherents compared to 77% in resource-poor settings, suggesting that adherence in the poorest regions of the world was at least as good, maybe even better, than in the rich regions of the world. The New York Times summed this up by saying Africans outdo AIDS patients, outdo U.S. patients in following AIDS therapy. I think, for the most part, this, these findings have remained true and that adherence in the poorest regions of the world is among the best levels. But now with simpler therapy, adherence among, in every region of the world has improved, and viral suppression is seen in most people. Why do we see such great level, why do we see such great levels of adherence in the poorest regions of the world? And I'll refer in this talk several times to the work of Norma Ware, who's a anthropologist at Harvard Medical School who has worked with our groups and others to understand why and how people take their medications through detailed qualitative interviews and ethnographic observation. Norma looked at over 200 patients taking antiviral therapy in Tanzania, Nigeria, and Uganda. And interviewed those patients, brought those themes together, say, why, how are people doing so well with their adherence? And the first thing that emerged is people do so well for same reason everyone takes medications, and that's simply to improve your health. But the story becomes more interesting when you go, dig into these stories to find ex story, stories of extreme poverty, where families, individuals were paying 50% of their daily or their monthly income simply to bring, get themselves to clinic to pick up the medications. And that is not only just the side effects, the remembering to take your medications, but you had to make a severe economic sacrifice just to have medications to pick up, which makes these levels of adherence even more extraordinary. But how do people overcome these economic barriers? They rely on their friends and family. They rely on their relationships to ask people for help in order to cover the cost of transportation to make it to clinic. And when people ask for help, then they feel a sense of obligation to the person who gave them that help. And they feel, fulfill that obligation by taking their medications, by staying strong, and giving back to that relationship. When you give back to that relationship, it makes that relationship stronger. So the person who helped you the first time is more likely to help you the second time. And then you feel that indebtedness, you give back, and then this creates value in the relationship, very tangible, even economic value, which can be described as social capital. So here is how we put together these relationships, that the major barrier to adherence is structural and economic barriers. There are these routine barriers throughout the world, medication side effects, depression, substance use, memory. But in poor, the poorest regions of the world, it's structural and economic barriers that lead to interruptions in care and interruptions in adherence that lead to biologic uh, failure. People use their social capital in order, over, in order to overcome these structural ec and economic barriers. Through this lens, I began to see stigma as a very different type of concept. Before this work, I saw stigma as this cognitive emotional domain where you feel depressed, you're isolated, you're lonely. But when you see adherence through social, the lens of social capital and the role of social capital, stigma takes on another dimension. And that if you can't disclose your HIV status because you're stigmatized, you can't ask your friend or your family for help. And if you can't ask your friend or family for help, then you neutralize the most important tool you have to overcome the economic barriers to care, which makes stigma both this cognitive emotional concept, but also a very structural concept that limits people's ability to access treatment, which explains to me why stigma is one of the most powerful predictors of incomplete treatment adherence. Next, I'd like to move to adherence to antiretroviral treatment for prevention. Now that we know that providing someone antiretroviral therapy, suppressing the viral load leads to massive reductions in the risk of transmission to a negative person. We have had a scale up of, anti a, a scale up of antiretroviral therapy, such that we want to give antiretroviral therapy in the US to everybody who's infected. And in poor regions of the world, at least uh, certainly go up above 350, up to 500 CD4 cells. But we're seeing widening cracks in the treatment cascade in Sub-Saharan Africa as we try to expand therapy to people with asymptomatic earlier disease. These are three, just three studies which have looked at people's 
success in the cascade as uh, with higher CD4 cells. Angry cats looked at people in South Africa and found that feeling healthy led to was one of the most common reasons for refusing antiretroviral therapy from the get-go. And over 20% of people refused to accept antiretroviral therapy. But Susan Atacum in Embora, Uganda, followed people on MEMS caps, electronic pill caps, and found that there's a twofold greater odds of treatment interruptions among people with 350 CD4s compared to less than 350, 300, less than 350 CD4s. And this is associated with a higher rate of virologic failure. And we also know that women going into a PMTC program have a twofold greater loss of follow-up if they have more than 350 CD4s. So people who are healthy are having a harder time engaging in the care and making it their way through the cascade. So why is this? Well, let me see how I'm putting it together. So we have our outcome treatment adherence. We have our structural economic barriers to care. Social capital uh, mitigates that and very much influenced by stigma. I think that this decline in health status in people with advanced disease has been very important in kicking in social capital. People get very, very, has historically gotten very, very sick, they become bed bound. When they become bed bound, they draw resources away from their family. The family is no longer able to go to the market to make, make income or work in the field. They have to care for a bed bound ill person. Emotionally costly, financially costly. And then when they take antiretroviral therapy, their family sees the individual get better. And it's that recovery that also reinforces social capital. So that this decline in health and economic status, which leads to HIV disclosure, which leads to the family and the social network understanding what's happening to that person in the role of antiretroviral therapy, we are hypothesizing this plays an important role in maintaining treatment success in people with advanced disease. So the question is, as we need to roll, up, roll out therapy to earlier disease, will we, will we need to have extra interventions uh, to engage social capital so people have the support they need to succeed on treatment? I'd just like to talk about loss to follow-up. This is Moses, who's a motorcycle driver who we call the ascertainer. We bought a motorcycle in Embora, Uganda, um, on the inspiration of Elvin Gang. The motorcycle cost about $2,000. I think we paid no Moses about $200 a month. And we said, go out and find the people who are lost to follow up in Embora University HIV clinic. And then, like many clinics, we're seeing 30 to 40% of people who were lost to care. But rather than just go find everybody, because you couldn't find everybody, we asked Moses to find people based on a random, num a random number generator of all the people who are lost, such that the people he did find, he could spend more, people find, more time finding people, and the people he did find represented all the people who were lost. He said, go find as many as you can, but make sure you do it in this sequence. Moses was able to obtain 90, figure out whether 90% of the people he tried to track were either alive or dead. And when you do the systematic sampling-based approach to retention and care, where you're looking at the patient rather than at the program, you see very different findings. First, you find out that not all loss is bad. About almost half the loss is because people are finding another clinic to go to that may be closer to go to, more, more convenient, cost less. That disengagement is overestimated because people are transferring care. But that mortality is underestimated. More people are dying than we know. And that the reason people are dying is not because they're missing their clinic appointments and then dying. They're missing their clinic appointments because they die first. We're starting people with advanced, on HIV treatment with advanced disease. They die between their clinic visits. And then because they're dead, they obviously miss their clinic visit. And so that doesn't mean we need to do more aggressive uh, retention and care interventions. It means we need to get people on treatment earlier. And we also find that epidemiologically, if you do this adjust for a, a systematic random sample, the findings you get from a systematic random sample, you get different risk factors for mortality. If you just look from your clinic, you'll see female gender is an important risk factor for 
for being lost. But if you sample and readjust the data, you find out their agenda is not associated with loss to follow up. But we've also, through the work of Norman Rare, learned a lot more about why people are lost, again, using qualitative interviews with ethnographic observation. And among the people that Moses tracked, uh, Norma and her team was able to interview 91 of these people in Nigeria, Uganda, and Tanzania to ask them why they no longer came back to clinic. And first, she found that there are unanticipated financial, structural, economic barriers to care, which was not, not which was very consistent to with our findings looking at treatment adherence. And here's one quote: "What caused me not to overcome, not to come to the clinic, was that I lost my father. When he died, I went to the town for the burial, and the money I had taken with me ran out. As I had to first stay there to make some more." to make some more to facilitate my return. When I was able to return to my home, I failed to get the money for transport to the hospital, so I started working to be able to return the amount enough to facilitate my transfer, <laughs> my transport fare. It's a very common story. There's a death in the family. The, fa the positive person has to cover burial expenses for the deceased level and often a parent or maybe a sibling. And that money that goes to burial expenses is the money that he or she was saving to make it to clinic to pick up his or her medications. But when they come back to clinic, they get a very punitive response by the adherence, often the adherence counselor. This is another participant who said, who came in late uh, for the visit and said, they told me you are late. Now there are problems people, now there are problems people face. I don't know how they perceive it, but for me, this thing is very difficult. Attending clinic every month is very difficult because you have to leave your work, sometimes report late for reasons like these. Everyone has problems. They're supposed to solve these problems with love, not harshly like they do. Until people are afraid of their words, abusive words, they behave as if they are there to beg for meds. It's our right to get the meds. So he or she, uh, she showed up late. She was met by the adherence counselor, says, you gotta take your meds, you're late, you know, you don't deserve these treatments. And she, she doesn't have a good experience. And then this, continues to a point of terminal engagement where the patient just gives up. I was scared of coming back and telling me that I, they will not accept me because I didn't come when they told me to. I was wondering whether they would accept me or not, or whether they would scold me. And so this is a person who just dropped out of care entirely. So putting this together, we have these structural economic barriers. Someone doesn't have enough money to go to clinic because they had a death in the family. They show up late for their visit. The registrar or the adherence counselor sees they're late, gives them a punitive message. You've got to take your medications. You can't, take, you can't miss your doses. That punitive clinician view or, then reinforces, maybe this clinic doesn't want me. This, this clinic is punishing me, is, is shunning me for, for missing my visit. And this creates a positive feedback loop, and eventually the patient is, has terminal engagement and loses, loses contact with the clinic. I'd like to talk about adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is a study by Slim Krim. I see Slim's coming in a few weeks. As I saw this on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I emailed Slim, this is such a great slide, can you send it to me? It was, uh, Twitter's an amazing thing. So this is a, a presentation that Slim gave that looks at the relationship between adherence measured by drug levels and pre efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis. And as you take your medication, as you take pre-exposure prophylaxis, the efficacy improves in almost a linear fashion. Clearly, pre-exposure pre prophylaxis, when an uh, HIV-negative person takes their medications, has a very strong effect. It's very effective at preventing HIV transmission. And let's highlight the work of Jessica Haber, who looked at the Partners Prep study where we had electronic pill caps and home-based unannounced pill counts. And in this subset of people, found very high levels of adherence between 98 and 99%. And in the 404 participants on placebo, there was 14 HIV infections, compared to zero out of 750 on active drug. 
So in this population, well, we know as good as anyone can ever know that they were taking 98 to 99% of their pre-exposure prophylaxis, all HIV negative people on PrEP, that the best estimate of efficacy is 100%. And that the 95% confidence, confidence interval is between 87 and 100%. Reinforcing the message that if PrEP is taken, it has very high efficacy. And I think that efficacy that is comparable to antiretroviral therapy in a virally suppressed person at preventing transmission from the positive to the negative. So Norma also went and studied PrEP in these patients we were following closely and tried to understand why is PrEP adherence so high in this one study of HIV discordant couples in Uganda and Kenya? And as you looked back, as you know, the other studies on South Africa, many other studies, adherence is really quite low. Very heterogeneous range of adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis. So Norma asked those people who were taking the PrEP, in, or in the Partners PrEP study, discordant couples, Stable discordant couples, tell me about your stories of adherence. And when you bring these stories together, these people say, the thing that challenges my relationship is the discordance dilemma, which in their words is, I'm positive, he or she, my partner is negative. We're worried about transmitting my HIV to him or her. This causes grief in our relationship. It make sex complicated. We argue about me being positive and what I did to become positive. I feel guilty about that. The negative person wants to be in a relationship but you know is scared to become positive. And this creates distance between the couple or the discordance dilemma. The offer or the promise of pre exposure prophylaxis reduces the even in, when this was still theoretical, reduces the risk of transmission in their minds. So there's hope that we can have a sexual relationship, that we can be together and worry less about transmitting HIV. And that PrEP mitigates this tension and makes for, resolves, reduces tension and resolves or lessens, at least lessens the discordance dilemma. And what do people describe this phenomenon as what PrEP does to their relationship? One, two, three. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> people say that the love in their relationship is increased by pre-exposure prophylaxis, by just resolving this towards the dilemma, by making people feel close again, by making the sex and the relationship less conflicted that they love each other more. But this also can work the opposite direction. Because taking a pill every day can also be a reminder of discordance, of the, the discordance dilemma in a setting when you don't trust your partner. So if your partner has a relationship outside the relationship has, and you no longer trust your partner, you still have to take this pill, you say, why am I taking this pill with this for, in order to protect my, in order to have sex with this loser? <laughs> and prep becomes a mechanism to express a discord. So I stop taking my prep because I don't want I don't want anything to do with you. And so discord and distrust becomes reinforcing in a relationship. And if the discord and distrust is introduced, it actually drives the relationship apart, and prep adherence falls apart. So this is the way I understand it. There's treatment adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis. There's still the routine barriers to adherence. And people talk about, in these qualitative interviews, they talk about the structural economic barriers, even in a study making the clinic. It takes time away from the market. It takes time away from the subsistence farm. It's so hard to get to, cl to the clinic to pick up your prep. And even HIV negative people are concerned about stigma. They're carrying around HIV medications. They're concerned that they're family or their neighbors will think they're positive. And these are all important barriers to PrEP adherence. However, the support of a relationship and how PrEP can bring the relationship together mitigates all these factors to make it possible to have very high levels of PrEP adherence. So the converse is true. If you are a young HIV negative woman in South Africa who has relationships with an older partner, which have less relationship support, 
you can't disclose your prep use, you can't engage your partner in helping you with prep use, then you have all these barriers to prep adherence and you have none of the relationship support to keep adherence going, which I think explains, in part, explains why some of the studies where women were recruited outside of a partnership um, had such low levels of adherence. And this is a picture from Fran Pitti and Ayavi that I think sums this up really well. This is a bottle of uh, Truvada and, and Citrabine, or placebo, we actually don't know, and a MEMS cap electronic pill cap that measures adherence. And this is a HIV negative woman who, in this study where she was taking daily prep, she found out that her partner had sex with somebody else. And she threw the MEMS cap and bottle at her partner, missed the partner, hit the wall, broke the MEMS cap, and even broke the Truvada pills. <laughs> We're recruiting this person for the Red Sox. <laughs> Watch out, Yankees. <laughs> What's love got to do? <laughs> All right, I'm going to end up on patterns of adherence and interruptions. Okay. So this is a work from Jessica Yugi, who found that interruptions in treatment are a major barrier, are a major cause of biologic failure and drug resistance. There's uh, individuals we followed in Uganda with electronic pill caps, and we found that individuals would interrupt their medications for more than 48 hours, two times on average every six months. When they interrupted, they interrupted for 11 days. They usually interrupted because they couldn't make it to clinic, or sometimes they went to clinic, there were no medications to pick up. And that these interruptions accounted for 90% of all missed doses. We then characterize the time course of interruptions to say, how long can you interrupt before you need to intervene? And this is work by Jean-Jacques Parenti, where we looked at patients on non nuke based treatment. They all were on MEMS caps. They're interrupting, and they interrupted their treatment spontaneously on their own. And we asked, what is the relationship between interruption duration and the probability of retaining virologic expression? So on the x-axis, you have how long someone <coughs> interrupts from 0 to 30 days. And on the y-axis, you have the probability of biologic expression from 1 to 0. So you can see that somebody who's interrupting for 2 or 3 days has a quite a, a, retains a good high probability of biologic expression. But as you interrupt for 3 to 5 days, this probability goes down. And at 15 days, you have a 50% chance of biologic rebound. And a good portion of those people will then develop drug resistance. <coughs> so this means it's a death in the family. Someone can't make it to clinic. You have about three days to figure that out, to get that person back on, to get that person in the clinic back on antiretroviral therapy before they have biologic failure and they are at risk for drug resistance. So how do we do this? Well, Jessica Haber has led a series of studies looking at Wise Pill, which is an electronic pill container, which holds about a month of medications. Every time this pill container is open to take out the medications, it communicates via the cell phone network to a server. And you can know in real time how someone's taking their medications. So here is one of our participants who's given us permission to share her picture. She's in Embarar, Uganda, about a five hour drive from the main city of Kampala. And here is her adherence record. She's on a twice daily regimen, uh, very characteristically has excellent adherence. A little bit early one day, a little bit early another day, but um, <coughs> doing quite well. She takes her medications at 8 in the morning and 8 in the evening. I'd just like to point out this dose here. This is April 16th at 8 a.m. local Uganda time, which was midnight. Our time. So we could log on to the computer now, and we could see uh, at 1 o'clock this afternoon, we could see whether she takes her 8 p.m. dose. And if she didn't take her dose, we could then send her an SMS text, a reminder. We could then contact her social network to help her um, take her medications if there's a problem. And if this continues even further, then you know, two to three days, then actually we can get her on the phone or we can get someone on a motorcycle with medications in hand to get her back on treatment before she fails. 
So what does love got to do with this? One, two, three. <laughs> this is good question. <laughs> this is an electronic gadget. And you think, what um, is this? Is this really? Um, you know, is is this just about the electronics? Well, we are ending this study. We have 650 people on these gadgets, and we're ending the study, and we're talking about taking back the gadgets. Norma again has interviewed these participants and said, there's no way I'm getting back my wise pill. <laughs> I love my wise pill because I know this device is connected to my providers. And I may live 40 kilometers from clinic. It may cost me 20,000 shillings, which is about $5 to make it to clinic. And it's hard to get to clinic, but I take comfort. I take comfort in knowing that my provider is connected to me through this device. And I think it's kind of ironic that there's, there's a greater sense of connection through this device than the adherence counselors are generating through interacting with patients with late visits. Now, but that's a, that's a challenge, but I think there's a lot to work with here. And what we're, way we're working with is, is bringing in the social network of this person. Obviously, we're working with the, the adherence counselor is now doing take a different approach to adherence counseling in terms of the clinics we're working in. But we're working with the social network of this person to not only use this device to make connections with the clinic, but make connections with the social network such that we have a treatment of adherent support or a community of adherent supporters that are all connected via uh, cell phones to help this person take their medications and overcome structural and economic barriers to care. So I will end on a story inspired by this quote by Andrew, from Andrew Nachos, the USAID, former USAID administrator. The Africans don't know what Western time is and don't know what you're talking about when asked to take drugs at specific times. This is a patient identified by Marissa Mayer, who's a UCSF medical student with me. And she came back from the field. She said, I met this amazing guy. His name is John. He works as a farmer. He lives in a three-room, mud-walled house. He owns a lantern, a bed, a sofa, a bike, and a radio, but no watch. He started HIV treatment on a very advanced disease and on twice-daily therapy. We followed his adherence with a MEMS cap, and here is his adherence record. And you see he's taking his medication twice daily. This looks pretty good. These, most of these doses are around 7.20 a.m., and these are 7.20 p.m. If you sum this up, he's taking 90% of his doses within 10 minutes of 7.20 a.m., and he's a little bit looser in the evening. It takes him a whole 17 minutes to take 90% of his doses. His overall adherence in these 90 days is 98.9%, and the 1.1% was a MEMS cap failure. So some of you have heard this story. How many have heard this story before? Oh, I thought more of you. Oh, it's still fresh. <laughs> um, I know Bob has. <laughs> All right. So the question is, this is, not, this is pretty darn good adherence. Remember, this he's an uneducated person, um, but we're also without a timekeeping device. And this is not just darn good adherence. This is minute, not, minute, not just minute by minute adherence. This is second by second adherence. So how does John adhere to his doses by the second without a watch? Uh, you got it. <laughs> he um, has a radio. And he turns on his radio every time. The sun rises at 7 o'clock in the morning. He turns on his radio when the sun rises. And at 7.20, there's a radio show called Radio West, which is kind of like the BBC NPR of Uganda. And it comes on at 7.20 a.m. He knows it's time to take his dose. So he takes his dose when Radio West comes on. Turns off the radio, then goes off into the field, works in the field to uh, uh, make food for his family. Comes back in the evening. The sun also sets at 7 o'clock p.m. He turns on the radio at 7 when the sun sets, and Radio West also plays in the evening. Guess what time Radio West plays? 7.20 p.m. Takes his pill at 7.20 p.m., turns off the radio, goes to sleep, and has another day. But this isn't the 
end of the story because we continue to follow John in here. He's on, still on twice daily therapy. We see these interruptions of about three or four days right here, which is, we believe, the recipe for biologic failure and drug resistance. This is when people are having trouble. This is their pattern of adherence. So what's happening to John? What happened to John to lead to these interruptions? Battery is still working. The radio is working. The radio is working. They're not ha there's no there's no pledge drive. No. All right. Uh, this is your last time. Now come on, we to bring it up. One, two, three. What's love got to do with it? John has a partner. His partner is going to clinic to pick up her medications at a different clinic. Her clinic runs out of medications. And so John is giving his partner his HIV medication so she can stay on treatment. I like this story because first, here's a complete, very person who's never been to day of school in his life, one of the poorest people on the planet who has a creative solution and has the best adherence on the planet. And that it overcomes our expectations, our, our prejudices about who will and who won't adhere to treatment. And that in understanding John's adherence, when he does have trouble, it's not really about John, it's about his relationship. And it's about his relationship with a, his loved one, his partner. And it's not about her forgetting to take her medications, it's about her not having medications to take because her clinic has a stock out. And that how, for me, the sums up of how structural economic barriers, drug supply and distribution is the Achilles heel of treatment success. And that this impacts the individual, but also impacts the social network and impacts people through their relationships. So what has love got to do with it in summary? I think that ill health, advanced HIV disease, plus economic sacrifice, plus love, plus your social relationships of your family, your friends, people who love you, all these things come together to overcome a very powerful force of stigma to help mobilize social resources to succeed on treatment. And that you gotta, all these things come together. And this is explaining successful treatment uh, in most people treated in some of the poorest regions of the world. But I think it also opens up a few cracks that we need to pay very careful attention to. And as we provide treatment to people with early disease, which we must do, they won't have that ill health. They'll still, the economic sacrifice won't be quite as much, or the economic sacrifice to stay on therapy will be the same, but without the, and they'll have people who love them and want them to be healthy, but without the ill health, if they don't disclose their HIV status, that they won't have the same social support to overcome economic barriers to care. And that a little bit of electronic love through our men's or our wise pill, we hope, can reinforce these connections and to find out who's having trouble, when they're having trouble, to then sort of juice up the system in terms of the immediate social network as well as relationship with the clinic to help these people with early disease have the connections they need to succeed on treatment. And then a period of view about missed clinic visits, about adherence, really through the work of Norma accelerates clinic loss. And we need more love in the clinic. We need a different approach to adherence counseling. I think in the clinics we're working with, we've been able to use this data to, to talk with the providers to adopt a more supportive approach to adherence counseling. In the past, this was really based on a, a fear-based message. If you don't take your, and we're responsible for that. We as adherence researchers, those of you, I, mean, I count myself as one of them. Now, you have to take 95% of your pills. If you don't, the whole world's going to fall apart. We're going to spread multi-drug resistant HIV. And so it was a really fear-based message. And I think now we turn those messages, reframe those messages in a more supportive and positive way that includes the close social network and the clinic. And that prep makes the love and better among stable committed discord partnerships. 
And this is great. This is a great opportunity for HIV prevention in this population where you can bring in the partner, both the positive and negative partner, and counsel them together about the role of PrEP and how that will enhance their relationship and bring them closer together. But this creates a challenge in that what we do in young women who are vulnerable, who can't bring in their partner for this discussion, is a very, very important challenge. I think for the success of pre-exposure prophylaxis, other prevention strategies, we need to figure out strategies that either can work without this level of social support or figure out ways to juice up the social support. So I'd like to, in addition to Julie, I'd like to thank my mentors, Andrew Moss and Tom Coates. Uh, I'd like to thank my good friend and colleague, Norma Ware, who has put meaning into our more quantitative electronic observations. I'd like to thank Jessica Haber, who's my mentee at Harvard, who has led our wireless uh, adherence studies. Conrad Mizora and Bosco Mugwesa Buana are our PIs in Uganda. Connie Kellen and Jared have done the prep work, and were funded by NIMH, uh, Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and some private donors. And then finally, many of you know Chris Gordon and Michael Stewart, great project officers who've been uh, very influential in shaping this work. So thank you very much.